This is the lecture for week six. This week we are talking about two-dimensional art. And from this point on in the semester, we will be uh, we will be talking about a different medium, whether it's drawing, painting, printmaking, sculpture, photography, video, and so on. We'll be talking about a different medium per week. If you haven't taken the opportunity to watch the introduction to museum essay and drawing assignment video, uh, please do. These two assignments have been assigned today. The drawing assignment is a short assignment that is due this week where I'm asking you to draw an image from home. The other assignment is your museum uh, visit essay and that is something that is I've assigned it today but it is due later in November but I'm assigning it to you now so that hopefully you get a head start on it I know you're coming off of your midterm exam and you probably don't want to think about your next big project but this project is worth more points than any other project in the semester. So think about it. Make sure you understand it. If, of course, if you have questions, send me an email. But let's get started on our sections of two-dimensional art. Two-dimensional art is art that is made in two dimensions, meaning a piece of paper. A piece of paper has a height, it has a width, but really no one focuses on the thickness of it. It is a flat thing that you can draw on making two-dimensional art. Three-dimensional art would be sculpture, which is something freestanding and has height, width, and depth. But for two-dimensional art, this week we'll be talking about drawing. Next week will be painting. Then after that, I think probably printmaking. So let's get started. Again, what is two-dimensional art? Art that by definition is flat. The format of and design principles within 2D art is characterized by having a length and a width. Versus three-dimensional art, art that by definition has a mass and volume. 3D art exists in real space and the design principles are characterized by having a length, a width, and a depth. So, what types of two-dimensional art are there? There are many variations of work that exist within the realm of two dimensions. Any work that can be measured only by length and width is 2D. We will be discussing the following art practices. Drawing, again, drawing, printmaking, experimental mark making, painting, collage. So chapter seven from your textbook, drawing. Types of drawing. Drawing, images produced as a result of running and rubbing implements across a surface. Think of crayons when you're growing up or pencils. It's rubbing that implement across the surface makes the drawing. Drawing is the most basic of the visual arts and perhaps the most accessible. Every child makes their first art with crayon and paper. Drawing is itself a point of entry into art and art making. Also, some of the oldest known art is in fact drawing. There are three categories that describe most drawings. Sketches. Quick drawings that record ideas or provide information. Have you ever heard of a sketchbook? Artists carry around sketchbooks. Artists don't typically do full, awesome, finished drawings in a sketchbook. Instead, they are working out ideas for bigger projects. Those are sketches. Other drawings are plans or 
preparatory studies for other projects. So plans would be like, imagine a blueprint. Uh, architect uses blueprints, but they're more plans in terms for art is more technical. So the plans will often be in sketchbooks as well. So sketches are more ideas, but plans are kind of figuring it out. And then another type of drawing is just fully developed in autonomous works of art. So those are the drawings that look awesome. They're the ones that are done, the ones that um, are just, just beautiful in themselves. So three types of drawings, sketches, plans, and then just a finished drawing. Like I said, some of the earliest artwork that we know about is in fact drawing. And if, so here, the earliest known and best preserved drawings, these drawings or, or paintings are found in Southern France. Just to give you some perspective, Homo sapiens left Africa 75,000 years ago. The Great Pyramid of Giza was built 4,600 years ago. These drawings are about seven great pyramids old. So we left Africa 75,000 years ago, and these are, what, 20 or 30,000 years old? Down here, you'll see in my description, it says cave paintings. Um, in southern France, and then you see something that says 32,000 to 30,000 BP. You'll see BP in uh, more current archaeology. What that means is simply before present. I want to click this link and show you uh, a, a quick video about those cave paintings or drawings. This is a preview for a film called Cave of Forgotten Dreams. This cave had been perfectly sealed for tens of thousands of years. It contained by far the oldest paintings ever discovered. It is as if the modern human soul had awakened here. This is one of the rare times anyone is allowed inside the cave. This may be the only and last opportunity to film inside. The first time I entered a cave, it was so powerful. Every night I was dreaming of lions. There are no barriers between the world where we are and the world of the spirits. A wall can talk to us. After five days, I decided not to go back in the cave because it was an emotional shock. These images are memories of long forgotten dreams. Will we ever be able to understand the vision of the artists across such an abyss of time? Silence, please. We're going to listen to the cave, and perhaps we can even hear our own heartbeats. So this documentary, The Cave of Forgotten Dreams, it is actually really good. If you have a chance to see it, it's great.
But it talks about, like I said, drawings and paintings that are 30,000 years old. And in some of these drawings, you see animals that we associate with Africa. And some of them are animals that we didn't know, that we knew were extinct, but we didn't know that humans encountered. So there's a lot that's been learned from history uh, or about people because of these caves. But um, I, it's just so great that the drawings in this instance can, they, they've survived. And uh, it's something that tells a story about our human existence. So from that respect, you could call drawing one of the really basic entry points into art. If it wasn't for drawing and the development of it, then we wouldn't have any of the art that we have today. And really, it might even be because it's such an easy method for getting our ideas onto a surface, it, it really, drawing came before the written word. And so it is, the, it marks the beginning of civilization. So that's my spiel about drawing. I think it's very important and uh, it's something definitely worth studying. So again, drawing be the entry, being the entry point to artwork, uh, everyone that I have ever met has drawn pictures. Think back to what pictures you have drawn. Did you draw a lot as a kid? Do you draw a lot now? The first entry point into art is drawing. So this is a drawing. Surprise, it's by me. I have a few drawings from when I was a kid that, uh, and I, I like sneaking this into the presentation. This is of course of Moses turning the sea into blood. And I, drew this in 1992 and I would have been five years old when this was drawn. So five-year-olds drawing, telling stories, getting images across. So here's an example of some sketches. Again, sketches are quick drawings that record ideas or provide information. So a sketchbook or your notebook or whatever, that's where your sketches can go. These are sketches by Leonardo da Vinci. I'm sure you've heard of him. He's, he's uh, you know, legendary. Anyway, these were drawn um, well, in the Renaissance in the 14, late 1400s. And these are his inventions for how stuff might work. So this is pumping water. It's his invention for pumping water. This, some of these drawings are rather technical. Not all sketches are so technical, but really he's working out the ideas. You wouldn't be able to build anything based off of these sketches, but it's working out the ideas. This is a finished artwork but what I like about it is that it looks like a plan, a plan for something that could be made. So uh, plans are preparatory studies for other objects. This large cabinet, preparatory study. And then of course, there is fully formed, 100% official artwork. Of course, drawing is a perfectly perfect, accessibly accessible, and wonderfully wonderful means of producing amazing art. Check this out. It is a fully developed and autonomous work of art. This is by an artist that I really like named Robert Longo. All charcoal on paper. And what charcoal is, is literally burnt wood. It's what you pull out of your fireplace. 
So this is a larger than life drawing. Well, not, I guess, technically not larger than the size of that bomb, but it is a very large drawing. It is about eight feet tall and about six feet wide, but it's beautiful. All right, so today we'll be talking about different drawing mediums. Most drawing media can be divided into two categories, dry and wet. Dry drawing media include pencil, charcoal, chalk and pastel, crayon. Wet media is ink, like the ink in a ballpoint pen, or a wash, which is the ink from a pen or ink like it that's been watered down and you can wash it uh, with a brush and it dries very quickly. It's sort of borderline uh, painting. So this is an example of what can be done with pencil. In terms of graphite pencils, artists can choose from different hardnesses and dimensions of lead. Some pencils are soft and leave very dark marks, whereas others are very hard and leave very light marks. If you were to go to the store and buy a new set of drawing pencils, you'll see that what you buy is a range of hardnesses. So it is very hard to very soft, and that's how the artist gets a range in value with a pencil. This is another great pencil drawing. What we have here is we have, of course, the drawing of this handgun, but the paper it's on is drawn as well. You see the shadow of it. The actual paper for the drawing is, there's a corner, there's a corner. This whole thing is drawn. So this is a drawing of a drawing on a piece of paper it this is really great it kind of blows my mind another drawing medium is charcoal charcoal is prehistoric and was even used by early man to draw on cave walls so the drawings of the buffalo and and the lions that were found in southern France those are a lot of them are charcoal, not all of them. A lot of them are charcoal. Drawing charcoal is the same today as it was historically. Char charcoal is either made from charred wood or charred bone. So this drawing by Jenny Seville, um, she, this, is, uh, this is charcoal. Another charcoal drawing. This one's way more smudgy. That's something that you can do with charcoal. Charcoal can get pretty messy, but uh, it's it's good for that reason, and also it's it's good that you can really get really dark darks. There's something called chalk and pastel. Of course, you've heard of chalk. What chalk is, is it's usually white. Sometimes it can be off-white or gray. But chalk is formed from dead sea creatures or like little diatoms on the bottom of the seafloor. And when the ocean recedes, you get these giant deposits of of what's called chalk and uh, parts of England are actually you dig down under the soil and you hit chalk so so chalk is a mineral and it's mined from the ground chalk feels similar to pastels it's not the same but it's similar pastels are you could describe them as colored drawing sticks or it's like chalk, but it's got color in it. They, they have uh, pigment suspended in a binder and baked. Pastels are all the colors, all the colors of the rainbow. So 
what I mean by pigment. Pigments are typically natural and they come from different parts of the world. So yellow might be a, tri a type of uh, dried tree sap that comes from uh, Vietnam and then uh, green is a little bit of copper of oxidized copper or red what might be actual rust and so you collect this stuff say the rust and so imagine flecks of rust off of a piece of steel and you collect it and you grind it down so it's really fine like super fine and then you mix it in with a binder so a binder is essentially a glue and if you get the right glue and the right proportions right you stick you you'll put that slurry I guess like a mix of stuff into a mold and you'll get like a nice stick of it after you bake it so you put it into a mold bake it all that glue or oil or whatever it is sort of evaporates out and what you're left with is this pigment that is in the form of a stick like chalk that you can uh, draw with. So this is a drawing made by a wonderfully talented but uh, morally corrupt man named Paul Gauguin. Um, this drawing is of uh, you know, it's a pastel drawing. Here's another pastel drawing. This time the artist used black paper. And so he did not use any black pastel. He just added color on top of the black paper. And on top of black paper, in this instance, the, the pastels really pop. Believe it or not, this is charcoal like we spoke about before, and it's also pastel. And what we're looking at is an artwork that's a rectangle. And then this package, this blue package, is drawn on top of the rectangle. So you can get super detailed if you know what you're doing. And, you know, this is obviously photoreal. I make a lot of art myself, I'm an artist, and I draw a lot, but there is no way I would be able to make this. It's beautiful though. Then there's such thing as crayon. Now, we have Crayola crayons that we grew up with. Uh, this drawing is actually made with a crayon, but it's a fancy French crayon that is called Conte. It's sort of a brand name, but crayons have been around a long time. And so what this drawing is from the 1879, 1880. Um, but similar to the pastel where there's a mineral that's suspended in some, si some sort of glue, there, this crayon is a mineral that is suspended in wax. So you never bake it, you just melt wax and you mix it together and then you end up having a waxy crayon. And that is what we're looking at. This is wax that has charcoal of all things because it's black. It's pulverized charcoal turned into a powder, crushed and turned to a powder and mixed into the wax. And that's how we have this black crayon. Another drawing done with crayon. This is from 1944. This is a famous, uh, what's called outsider artist. So that is an outsider artist is a person who by definition doesn't have a formal education and uh, is working 
alone, um, sometimes in seclusion. And so they start coming up with uh, crazy artwork that is outside of what we are familiar with. These are outsider artists. All right, so like I said, ink, you can draw with ink. So that is a wet medium. By far the primary wet or fluid medium uh, used is pen and ink. Ink in one form or another developed independently in many cultures around the world. Ink has been made from the sap uh, in trees, crushed plants, tar, and carbon. So what ink is, is essentially a mineral, just like in crayons or pastels that are mixed in to water or something like water and it's just floating in there and then you can use a brush use a pen but you can use that and draw with it ink doesn't have to be brown like this it can be very black Here's one. This is all ink. Often when you see ink drawings, they have high contrast. They're very black and very white. So the white is the paper showing through and black is, you know, everything else. So you see cross hatching and things going on that with the shades of gray. This is ink. And then if you were to use a bigger brush, this sort of is where you start getting into painting, but this become ink becomes a wash. Washes are commonly applied with brushes and dry quickly. This is an image of a thinned ink. So you can take ink and you can thin it down even more with water. And that's how you get the light grays on the feathers, things like that. And it gets darker in some places. famous Japanese artist. Another ink drawing. All right, so that is it for the different drawing mediums. This is, I, I wanted to introduce you to drawing and drawing mediums. And that's going to be the majority of a lot of our lectures from now on. Um, so don't expect them to... I, I don't expect to blow your mind with anything other than showing you really great artwork. The next section we'll cover today is experimental mark making. It can be argued that experimental mark making is very similar to drawing, where you're making a mark on canvas, on paper, on a surface, and but you're not doing it in a traditional way. So what makes a mark? So many things make marks. Drawing can be made an entirely random act, though it too can be random but within constraints. What I mean by that is you can set up circumstances in which an, a mark will be made on an artwork. You don't control every aspect of it, but you have orchestrated the circumstance in which it'll work. So what ways can marks be made? Well, you can walk down the floor scuffing your shoes on the floor and doing it on purpose and you could draw a face by doing that another thing you could do is you know throw rocks at paper or at walls and things and and the way the paint gets scratched or the way the paper is damaged and so on and so forth, that's all 
experimental mark making. And there are so many ways to make marks. Here's one. You can use fireworks. So this artist, Sai Guo um, Kyung, he is known for making a lot of art with explosives, gunpowder. And really what we're looking at is paper where he carefully sprinkled little bits of gunpowder in a pattern going around and then set the gunpowder off and the gunpowder burned very quickly and it probably set the paper on fire in some places but he was able to make all these quick little spots Here's a collaboration between an artist named Dennis Oppenheim, who was a mostly a sculptor, um, but this is uh, between Dennis Oppenheim and his son. Can you figure out what's going on in these images? So the person in control seems to me to be the person that is drawing on the back of the other person. So in this image here, Dennis Oppenheim is drawing this shape with the marker on the back of his son. And his son is supposed to interpret what is being drawn on him. And he's drawing it then on the wall. Again, Things can happen. There's room for error, room for mistakes. Um, but that is what experimental mark making is, setting up parameters in which marks can be made. And what's this quote? It says, as I run a marker along Eric's back, he attempts to duplicate the movement on the wall. My activity stimulates a kinetic response from his sensory system. I am therefore drawing through him. So Dennis Oppenheim uh, is actually saying that, yes, he's in control, but he is drawing what Eric is doing. That is his drawing, which I suppose would be true to an extent. <laughs> this is a fun type of drawing that we see. This is called an exquisite corpse and I hope I can explain this to you well enough and this would be a fun thing to do with uh, friends or with your family. And you might have done a version of this in school, I don't know. But exquisite corpse, it's, uh, it's collaborative where you fold a paper. If you look closely you can see a seam here and, it's, and a, a fold here and a fold here. So these, it was folded three times to make an accordion. And so for this drawing, one artist, these are the artists that work together on this drawing. One artist drew the head of a figure and it looks like they drew two heads, but they folded the paper over hid the heads from the next artist, and then the next artist had to draw the torso. Then the next artist, then they folded, and the next artist couldn't see either of those, and then they drew the legs. And then they had to figure out what the, the last artist had to figure out what the figure that he doesn't know is standing on, and he comes up with this. So that's a collaborative approach to mark making.